Hello, my name is Joy Buell. On behalf of the Indigenous Heritage Film Festival and the Gloucester 400 Plus Committee, I welcome you to our celebration of Indigenous heritage and culture. We wish to honor the four directions and acknowledge the many generations of Indigenous people who first lived on this unceded land upon which we'll watch these films, as well as those Indigenous people who live here today and those generations who will live here tomorrow and in the future. Our goals for this festival are to engage you, to entertain you, and to educate you regarding the rich cultural, artistic, and philosophical contributions of America's original inhabitants. Some of the films that you will view here may challenge your pre-existing knowledge and understanding of Indigenous people in America. We're hopeful that watching these films will encourage and facilitate thoughtful conversations that will lead to a more accurate and meaningful appreciation of Indigenous people in your community and around the world. Thank you for coming to the Indigenous Heritage Film Festival. We hope that you'll find this experience meaningful, rewarding, and thought-provoking. Nearly 400 treaties between the U.S. and American Indian nations. They are the pages of an extraordinary story. The rise of a new great nation at the sacrifice of hundreds of others. Now, more than 100 years later, those treaties still stand. And so do the native peoples, holding both sides to the promises they made. We're bound by those treaties. Your nation is bound by those treaties. And we have to go back to that very basic foundation of shaking hands and facing the future together. In order to understand fully the American experience, you have to understand the relationship between the United States and the Indian nations, how that relationship evolved right up to what it is today. America is missing the treaty story. America is missing this important part of diplomacy amongst nations that made the United States the United States. Treaties are their treaties. They're not just Indian treaties. One of the earliest treaties was known as the Two-Row Wampum Belt, or Guswenta. Without a single word, it conveyed both term and spirit of the relationship between two nations. The two purple rows of beads symbolize two paths. One for the European ship, one for an Indian canoe. They would travel forward into the future side by side, not intersecting or interfering with each other. And surrounding white beads symbolize the enduring peace and friendship between the two nations as they traveled down the river of life. The Gaswenta set the tone of goodwill and equality for the early written treaties. These treaties really were made by people who wished each other well and who depended on each other. They didn't want to see each other be harmed. In the first years of American independence, treaties were a good deal for both sides. They guaranteed friendship and allies for the Americans when they were in a very weak position, and they guaranteed peace and security for the Indian nations in North America who were worried about expansion. But while the Gaswenta always wove the ideals of fairness and brotherhood, the written treaties took on an increasingly stark, not at all parallel path. As more and more European immigrants poured into the country, as more and more land was needed by the United States to accommodate all these new arrivals, the promises that had been made previously were simply forgotten. People say it was inevitable, 
that the United States would become a continental nation, that all of these Indian nations would fall away. But it wasn't inevitable. Every step in the process of the dispossession of the native nations, people were making choices. So that a hundred years later, they're still native nations. The ancestors were looking through time in consideration in providence for the coming generations. They put their faith in the treaties, and we're here today because of that. Hello and welcome to another episode of A Sculpted Journey of Ireland. We've all driven past them, we've all admired them, and even criticised them. But how many of us know the stories behind them? This week I'm travelling to Middleton, County Cork, to find out more about a sculpture which has united two very different communities through hardship. This piece is known as Kindred Spirits, or perhaps better known locally as The Feathers. To tell me more, I met up with its sculptor, Alex Pentec. Well, I suppose it really started with uh, an open competition run by Cork City Council um, that was uh, nationally and internationally advertised to reflect on the 1847 Choctaw donation to Ireland during the famine, Choctaw Native American Indians, that is. And so this is a donation of uh, about $170, um, which was all they had at the time and translates into a lot of money in today's money. And um, 
was one of the first ever international famine relief donations, historically noted. During the famine, there was mass emigration and word was traveling very quickly. Um, even though there was no internet, um, word of mouth and letter and newspaper. Um, it was decided at a meeting in Scullyville um, um, that they would do something about it, that they would put their, their resources together and send what they had, and they sent everything they had over to Ireland to, to, sort of, to try to save as many lives as possible. Thirteen years prior to the Irish famine, the Choctaw suffered their own devastation, called the Trail of Tears. The forced migration from their ancestral home in the Mississippi region to the area we know today as Oklahoma was part of an ethnic cleansing effort to remove the Indians. They were marched in severe weather and died in their thousands from starvation, cholera and exposure. The people who survived empathised with Ireland as one oppressed nation to another when they heard the plight of the Irish. Even with all of that, I realised that actually some things are beyond my imagination and I couldn't imagine, number one, the situation in Ireland and number two, the horror of seeing your family members literally perishing next to you and being powerless to do anything about it. But the ideas I was thinking of were firstly that idea back to things being unimaginable and that a literal representation of that history, number one, it's impossible and number two, it would always be sort of crass in some way or, or not really fitting uh, and would almost belittle the subject by trying to bracket it into, into one image. So I realised that my approach would have to be symbolic in some way and so I looked at the form of an empty bowl, um, symbolic of the million who perished here in Ireland and the great hunger and the famine. Um, and also then I looked at round tipped eagle feathers that are used in Choctaw ceremonial dress. And so by making a fusion of these ideas and, um, and images, I was able to sort of put them together to, to come up with the idea. When people come along here just to take a look at your sculpture, what do you hope they see? What do you hope they take away from it? So, I mean, this is my response to quite a very specific history um, and a story. I also think that, um, or it's my hope, that a, an artwork would have a life of its own and that it would be reinterpreted anew by each person who sees it and I definitely wouldn't feel even as an artist qualified to to judge or to tell someone that wasn't what I was thinking um, I would say that each reinterpretation of a work is automatically valid by the person who's looking at it so I would respect that and it would be my hope that the work could go on to have other new meanings and new interpretations. There's over 20,000 wells in the entire piece and that took um, over a year to, to complete. The piece is standing six metres by six metres and I couldn't pin it down to the factory floor to actually erect it all, to see all the elements in place. So it was only until we started actually bolting it to the foundations, one by one, that I could start to see how it would take shape and if it worked or not. And as we put each feather down, working with the team, uh, I got more and more excited. Uh, and at that point, a couple who happened to be from Oklahoma came and asked to take some images, photos, and they did and shared them online. And it, it went the rounds on social media until I got um, contacted by Chief Gary Batten's office of the Choctaw Nation, First Nation American Indians, uh, thanking me for remembering our shared history. And so, so it, it sort of grew legs really um, from the very start, even before it had actually been properly installed. It had been shared and had kind of taken its own life. So not every work that I would make would have that sort of popularity. 
And actually at the ceremonial launch um, where Chief Gary Batten um, was invited with uh, other council members to come and uh, be part of the ceremony, which was amazing to, to see and to meet him and all, all the fellow tribe members. He said something at the launch which really made me sort of think of this very question. And so he said that, yes, it ref reflects the history and yes, it responds to our shared heritage, the sort of the, the native Choctaw bonds, but um, that also it speaks to humanity and standing together against adversity. And that that's a message that continues on into the future to have as much meaning today as it did back then. Alex, thank you so much for taking the time to speak to me. I thoroughly enjoyed learning not just about this beautiful work of art, but also about our history. If your travels allow you to pay this sculpture a visit, then please take a moment to appreciate what the Choctaw and the Irish both suffered, and only then celebrate this momentous symbol of gratitude. Once again, thanks for tuning in to A Sculpted Journey of Ireland. This Indigenous Heritage Film Festival is part of the Gloucester 400 Plus celebration because the human history of Cape Ann began a long time before the founding of Gloucester by English colonists. And also because Indigenous history and colonial history are inseparably intertwined. Indigenous peoples have lived here over the past 10,000 years or more. The people living on Cape Ann at the time of the English settlement were known as the Pawtucket, or Agawam Indians. They were a branch of the Penacook Abenaki people of the Merrimack Valley in New Hampshire. They migrated into this area around 750 or 800 years ago and established ties with the Nipmuc, the Massachusetts, and other people living in the area at that time. They came to fish and to farm they dug clams and gathered other shellfish. In their gardens, they grew maize, squashes, beans, native sunflowers and tobacco, and other plants. They trapped beaver and muskrat for the French fur trade and had acquired European trade goods prior to English settlement. At the time of the English settlement, the Pawtucket had a village on the Riverview Peninsula between the Anasquam River and Mill River called Wanasquam or Wanasquiwam. And there were numerous satellite settlements, for example, on Lobster Cove in Anasquam, on the Jones River Salt Marsh at Wingersheek, on Old Garden Beach in Rockport, on Sawmill Brook in Manchester by the Sea, and near the Chebacco River in Essex. On the islands of Essex Bay, Agawam Village on the Ipswich River in Ipswich, and other sites. There is archaeological and documentary evidence for all these settlements. Indigenous people also had ceremonial gathering places and sites for sky watching, for example, on Gloucester's Poles Hill. In 1625, the Dorchester Company settlers from England found they had to relocate from Cape Ann to an indigenous village on the southern shore of Wenham Lake called Namkiag or Nahunkiak. They survived there through the hospitality of the Pawtucket and established Salem Village nearby. In Gloucester, the Pawtucket had cornfields along Mill River. That included unplanted fields that they had prepared for future cultivation, which the English bought as a site for Gloucester Plantation. In 1638, John Endicott wrote that he had bought the hoed ground from the Indians on Cape Ann in exchange for the corn they would have grown on it. The Sagamore, Masconomet, 
led the Pawtucket there at that time. Endicott later had Cape Ann surveyed for a fishing plantation and a cut connecting Ipswich Bay to Massachusetts Bay via the Anasquam River. He mapped future house lots on the Riverview Peninsula adjacent to Wanasquam Village. The Pawtucket were living here during the colonial period. The general court of the Massachusetts Bay Colony had initially ruled that indigenous people retained the right of co-residency after the sale of their lands. This later changed. In the meantime, many became Christians and attempted to assimilate into the Puritan culture. The village of Wanasquam was not abandoned until 1686, ten years after the disastrous war known as King Philip's War. In that war, Metacomet led the Wampanoags in defense of their homeland against Plymouth Colony's intrusions. That war forever changed the relationship between colonists and indigenous peoples. After 1700, it was not possible to live openly or freely as indigenous in southern New England. This film festival was developed to celebrate Cape Ann's indigenous heritage and to present indigenous perspectives on our shared history. Indigenous people are here today. Together, we are living on indigenous homelands. We are stewards of the land, water, and natural resources that sustained millions of people over many millennia, and we are responsible for that today. The Indigenous Heritage Film Festival aims to honor that heritage. I was adopted by a white missionary couple. I was adopted. Immediately placed for adoption. I was in foster care with um, one family for uh, 18 years. They were white. My parents loved us, and I understand that, but at the same time... They took the idea that um, they were saving me. Saving us. Um, from ourselves. Being saved and I should be grateful for the life that I've been given because any child on the reservation would give anything to live as I was living. They took us away from our mom. They came marching right in and literally took us and thousands of other children from their home. It's a way to er eradicate us and to go to a nation's children is one of the sure ways to do that. The U.S. has a long and brutal legacy of attempting to eradicate Native Americans. For centuries, they colonized Native American lands and murdered their populations. They forced them west and pushed them into small, confined patches of land. But Native Americans resisted. A Board of Indian Commissioners report said, instead of dying out under the light and contact of civilization, the Indian population is steadily increasing. And that was an obstacle to total American expansion. So the U.S. found a new solution to absorb and assimilate them. It all started with an experiment and a man named Richard Henry Pratt. He had in his charge some prisoners of war and he taught these men how to speak English, how to read and write, and how to do labor. He dressed them in military uniforms and basically ran an, an assimilation experiment. And then he took his results to the federal government and said they're capable of being civilized. So he was able to get this project funded. In 1879, the government funded Pratt's project, the first ever off-reservation boarding school for Native American children. His motto was to kill the Indian and save the man. What started there at the Carlisle Indian Industrial School was nothing short of genocide disguised as American education. 
Children were forcibly taken from reservations and placed into the school, hundreds, even thousands of miles away from their families. They were stripped of their traditional clothing. Their hair was cut short. They were given new names and forbidden from speaking their native languages. To take our children and to indoctrinate them into Western society, to take away their identity as indigenous peoples, their tribal identity, I think it's one of the most effective and insidious ways that the U.S. did do harm to, to, to indigenous peoples here because it targeted our children, our most vulnerable. And they tried to make us ashamed for being Indian and they tried to make us something other than Indian. There are also accounts of mental, physical, and sexual abuse, of forced manual labor, neglect, starvation, and death. My great-grandfather went to Carlisle and nobody in my family ever talked about it. So if you Google Indian boarding schools, the majority of the pictures that you will see will be actually from Carlisle. Colonel Pratt created propaganda. He hired a photographer to create those before and after photos to show that his experiment was working. So it was, you know, intentional propaganda. And it worked. The Carlisle model of education swept the country and led to the creation of over 350 boarding schools to assimilate Native American children. On the one hand, we have the Navajo as we find him in the desert. Few of these boys and girls have ever seen a white man. Yet, through the agencies of the government, they are being rapidly brought from their state of comparative savagery and barbarism to one of civilization. In 1900, there were about 20,000 Native American children in these schools. By 1925, that number more than tripled. Families that refused to send their kids to these schools faced consequences like incarceration at Alcatraz or the withholding of food rations. Some parents who did lose their children to these schools even camped outside to be close to them. Many students ran away. Some found ways to hold on to their languages and cultures. Others, though, could no longer communicate with family members. And some never returned home at all. By stripping the children of their Native American identities, the U.S. government had found a way to disconnect them from their lands. And that was part of the U.S. strategy. During the same era in which thousands of children were sent away to boarding schools, a number of U.S. policies infringed on their tribal lands back home. In less than five decades, two-thirds of Native American lands had been taken away. The whole thing was purposeful. And the fact that it has been buried in the history books and, and not acknowledged is also intentional. And in fact, the same tactics were used in New Zealand, Australia, Canada. All of these countries have acknowledged, apologized, or reconciled in some way, except for the United States. Over time, the brutality of boarding schools started to surface. And after a 1928 report detailed the horrific conditions at some schools, many began to close. In the 1960s, indigenous activism rose alongside the civil rights movement. And by the 1970s, that activism forced more schools to shut down. The government handed over control of the remaining boarding schools to tribes to be run in partnership with the Bureau of Indian Affairs. But just as the boarding school era started fading, another assimilation project took shape, adoption. The main goal of this pilot project was to stimulate the adoption of American Indian children to primarily non-Indian adoptive homes. They claimed it was to promote the adoption of the forgotten child, but it was essentially a continuation of the boarding school assimilation tactics. And the strategy came with a financial advantage for the government too. Adoption was cheaper than running boarding schools. But first, adoption officials had to sell white America on the idea of adopting Native American children. Feature stories like this one in Good Housekeeping marketed them to white families. They were described as unwanted and adoption gave them a chance at new lives. In the end, their media campaign worked. White families wanted Indian adoption. 
But the problem was, many of these children were not orphans that nobody wanted. They were kids often ripped apart from families that wanted to keep them. You still will hear stories today of people, you know, my age, older, saying, I remember as a child, um, the social worker was coming and people would hide their children. On reservations, social workers used catch-all phrases like child neglect or unfit parenting as evidence for removal. But their criteria was often questionable. Some accounts describe children being taken away for living with too many family members in the same household. An extended family is a big thing for Native people, and that means being judged for being in a house that's overcrowded. So it's always whiteness is the standard for success and everything else is judged by that standard. By the 1960s, about one in four Native children were living apart from their families. The official Indian Adoption Project placed 395 Native American children into mostly white homes, but it was just one of many in an era of Native American adoptions. Other state agencies and private religious organizations began increasingly making placements for Native American children, too. My mother giving me up was a white person telling her if she didn't, she would never see her other kids again. In one of the documents I have, it's addressed to my biological father, Victor Fox, that he was trying to look us up to get a hold of us. But Hennepin County wrote, Daniel and Douglas are adapting very well in their new family. This was totally, um, it was a false statement. When you're adopted, you know you're missing something. Um, I think I've likened it to having like, when someone has like a 500 piece puzzle and they have all the pieces to make this pretty picture except one. My adoptive mother was not well verbally, physically, and sexually, and, and spiritually abusive. So by the, by the time I was 14, I started drinking. 15, drugs were added, and I became an addict to numb. I didn't realize I was numbing pain. I tried suicide, I tried slicing my wrist one time. Children were taken and believed like I believed for a long time that there was something wrong with me versus something wrong with the system. The Indian Adoption Project was considered a success by the people who set it in motion. Officials claimed, generally speaking, we believe the Indian people have accepted the adoption of their children by Caucasian families and have been pleased to learn the protection afforded these children. But the truth was unsettling. These hearings on Indian children's welfare is now in session. Well, I was pregnant with Bobby and the welfare kept coming over there and asking me if I'd give him up for adoption. Before, you, before he was even born? Yeah. They picked up my children and placed them in a foster home. And uh, I think that they were abused in a foster home. Four years after Native people organized in this Senate hearing, Congress passed the Indian Child Welfare Act, known as ICWA. It gives tribes a place at the table in court. States would be required to provide services to families to prevent removal of an Indian child. And in case removal was necessary, they would have to try to keep the child with extended family or another Native American family. Without our relatives, we cease to exist. So with Native people, part of our wealth is in our family. It's in who we're connected to. But the legacy of family separation in Native communities has been difficult to fully undo. Today, Native American children are four times more likely to be placed in foster care than white children, even when their families have similar presenting problems. In these cases, ICWA is often the best legal protection they have, and it's been under attack repeatedly. A young girl ripped from her foster family because of the Indian Children Welfare Act. White adoptive families intent on keeping Native American children have tried to do away with the act, 
and they're often backed by conservative organizations. The Indian Child Welfare Act was dealt a blow earlier this month. The subject of a lawsuit issued on Tuesday by the Goldwater Institute arguing that preferences given to American Indian families to adopt Indian children is unconstitutional and discriminates based on race. It's a, it's a way for these industries, um, these very powerful industries, to try to attack what Indian identity is. Wanting to overturn ICWA is connected to everything about who we are as a nation. So if we don't have any protections for our families, and if we don't have protections for our treaties, then we have um, no more Indians. We've been under attack, we're gonna continue to be under attack. And we have to keep, just keep fighting. It's in our DNA to survive. We are nations that pre-exist European contact, and we are still here. Chigigo was soon, like a gate in a west coming. Come much will even, as you will get scock. Come much and I know as well to multipin, how you would be jipped, see there when. We joke, I mean, eh? Would you give you a joke, I'm all good squabbing our keeg. Beach, eh? Ella Ickpen, Mesmer would skin horses, where we'd had many yog. Most of we know, Ella Jixed would, Ed Yog, Willie Nogwalk. I got edgy chit park, which go abog. Sick day I'll go to Negum to meet on which go abog. Well, we do have money out there now. Oak must sell. Ellie Midge me edic. Do we gill on? Scobbinar keg. Would you come on giz horse? Would you give the speak horse head? asked what would be meaningful to Wabanaki people? How do we create something that will cause transformation? I said play your music at sunrise because it's part of our culture. Vegeta has in what skin horses, Tolian, Yala bid need nekum, would talk which cook webby chiji twin, you tell what you all, tell need to chiji twin all, Vegeta not your web ala gizos, chill mouse win org. Tap on a GG twin, take down Mutual. 
Illuminated Skinosis. Dunna Bwentley, Ewe Bellan, Giz Ossel. Illuminated TG Twin, Illum Dots, we linked to Ewe One. Dots, we will as welcome one. I got Dots, we see that when we joke again. We de lint. Illuminated Skinosis. Gago Bellin, do. TG Twin Teal. Dun Dapu Gag. Guess we de Chi Bejia Wig, Kmus Hornock. Saga wood, magenta on your wood. Skinosis, wood Gigi twin, negum dana magenta on. Majeki do marsin. Elab de muted. The dog will chip an oak. I had a really interesting idea that I would teach Yo Yo a song, a powwow song. And he's going to accompany me. So we're going to see how this is going to go. <laughs> so, you ready to give it a try? All right, here we go. Our ancestors have 12,000 years of welcoming the day. The meaning for me personally in welcoming the sun is deep. I truly am thankful for every day that I get. That I get to be a dad to my kids and I get to raise them in a world where I hope that when I'm done here in this place, I've left it better for them. And that's what it's all about. It then, uh, man, I got you there, sucky, spigos and gizos, ducky there, giz yummy, kid water there, see the when numial, a jug will mum quiz it, a jug biddy art egg psigag, GG Tony had a yog nicked skidginog, nicked egg squabnock egg, GG Tony had an ed, Ellie gizos, come on, gizel mugun, Elmiad, man, I got you there, Elmiad, musquinug, Elmiad, not sagiad, good gihi, was this, what you know, negamo. Because he will in a meat at it. Naga, will mum cause eat it. Gillon nid, squabbinak egg, that's well look yak. Naga, come on, nid. See the Hadman then. Nid lay just come out. She will win. to be around our tribal elders, being able to learn songs, being able to just be present is beautiful. We are Wabanaki, we're still here. Our youth can see this, people that they know, taking space, holding space unapologetically. Jivaloon. I feel very committed to 
embracing my obligation as a Pueblo woman to care for this earth and to care for the people on it. When I think about what my ancestors went through, fighting famine and drought, trying to live through colonization, holding on to the land, because that's what gives us life, we can't ever give up. I think meaning is so elusive, and yet everybody who spoke today was filled with meaning. The fact that you can think of seven generations back and seven generations forward is a big lesson for us. Who can think that way? You can the way you take care of the land, and the way you take care of one another. We can learn from that. And so your gift to us, we now have to carry forward and do. We all here to not just listen to people, but what follows is perhaps the most powerful thing. We have to take those things into consideration seriously. If we just leave here feeling good temporarily, then we've wasted our time. I see a lot of optimism because I see the generation to follow me. I see the next generation working their damnedest. We have a lot of work to do. They have a lot of work to do. She will leave one. That's we are now so divan, Alan Mingan, me talk snow. Jerome Quay, well, Dine, Bawam covers all Dine. That's we are now so Tiban Alan Menga Knejan. No, that's we are now so Tiban Alan Menga Knejan. No, Jerome Quay, well, Tine. Ma wam kava zotine Wate webe umma Wam kava zotine Wate webe umma Wam kava zotine Wate webe umma
Alright. So, what is Thanksgiving? Thanksgiving is insane. It's this huge, incredible disaster on highways and airports, and it's crowded, and the weather's awful. A meal that takes days, sometimes weeks of preparation, emotional turmoil, fights. But the fact that it's a national holiday that really envelops everyone, it's a sense of the entire country in motion in a way that isn't really like any other day in American life. And the way it's corny, it's cartoonish and kitsch is kind of a protective layer to sort of not get too direct about it. So underneath all those things, Thanksgiving is about trying to come to terms with this very difficult truth about the United States, that the country is a national project that came about at great expense to Native people. And it's not enough that we're a good country. We kind of have to be the best country, you know. But Native people and African slavery, those two things together are huge challenges to how you process this. So eventually the country ended up deciding, you know what, we like the story about that meal at Plymouth a long, long time ago in which these newly arrived people from England in this new country had their brunch in the forest with Indians. And what was that saying? That was saying that we're, you know, we're, we're neighborly. We want this to work out. And we know it didn't all work out. But that's what we aspire to be. That's sort of our best selves. Did that meal actually happen? It happened, but nobody really cared. It wasn't like, oh, remember that time last November, let's have those folks over again, fire up the grill. Nobody thought that because it was just a thing that happened. But the pilgrim folks there, they were writing letters or writing journals. They were like really meticulously detailing what was happening. But um, even that written account gets lost for basically 200 years and doesn't even emerge until the 1840s when this document is discovered again. And even then, it's not a big deal. It's actually in a footnote. And we remember that. We, we rescue it from being a footnote because that has meaning now. And so by the early 20th century, Indians are an indivisible part of what creates the United States. It's not a chapter that happened and it was bad and we got over it. Where in your head? We're in your pantry. We're in your garage this imagery, representations, advertising, Thanksgiving says, however imperfectly we remember Indians, we're remembering Indians. And with all the problems with it, it's still a powerful idea, and it's still powerful to not Photoshop Indians out of the national narrative, to, to, to say, we're owning this. And there's a way that can open up ways to start thinking about it differently, opens up for people to become activists and try to change things, invent some new kind of Thanksgiving. Let's have the discussion. Let's, let's see where that goes. But before you get to the lessons, I mean, is it right to use that? Is it whatever? I don't know. I guess if I were to put myself in terms of, you know, this a cartoon Indian and all this at Thanksgiving, I'd probably be saying, I'm glad to be here. Better than the alternative. By the early 19th century, the U.S. was rapidly growing, both in size and power. 
Land-hungry and ambitious, the new country was also drastically changing its policies towards the Indian nations. And nowhere was this more evident than in the treaties. The United States' primary interest in treaty making was to acquire Indian land. And so the treaties were used for that purpose, especially as the United States found itself in a position to pretty much dictate the terms of the treaty. And so the treaties morphed from this friendship and reciprocity sort of relationship into a very one-sided thing. There's almost a mythology about this that somehow when the pilgrims arrived, they were dragging land behind them. <laughs> there was no land brought here. The land here was Native nations. And this is what the United States needed. It's what it wanted. They wanted all of it. They wanted everything. The greed came in. Well, we have a little tract here now. Now we need a little more. And, well, we need to go make another treaty. We didn't understand that eventually those treaty-making processes ended up to the acquisition of all of our ancestral homeland. That land was a part of us. That land helped us be. That land was who we were and who we are. The command of removal came unexpectedly upon most of us. There was a time that we noticed several overloaded wagons were passing our home yet we did not grasp the meaning. Then one day, wagons stopped. We were to be taken away and leave our homes, never to return. To get what they wanted, U.S. officials brokered treaties through any means available. Their tactics were so corrupt that the once trusted treaties became quickly known as bad paper. There were people at these treaty negotiations who would do anything to get an agreement on the table. And so there was very routinely bribery, individual payments made to tribal leaders, uh, alcohol would be used to put people in, a, in an agreeable frame of mind, and even coercion to say to people, you must sign this agreement or else. Every means of trickery and fraud was employed against Native nations. The United States would appoint a false leadership people who had no right to speak for the tribe and say, you're the leader of this tribe, sign this paper giving away all your land. As the century progressed, the treaties became more and more lopsided, a far cry from the parallel paths of the Gaswenta. Despite appeals from the Indian nations, the U.S. kept on its new trajectory, rationalizing its aggressive actions along the way. They have neither the intelligence, the industry, the moral habits, nor the desire of improvement. The tribes of Indians inhabiting this country were fierce savages. To leave them in possession of their country was to leave the country a wilderness. It's important in the great American mythology to describe the Americas as wilderness. Because of its wilderness, then there's really nobody to dispossess. It was okay to come here and prosper and conveniently forget that there were already people and civilizations in place. At first we had something to eat, but that gave out and we were starving. We came to a slippery elm tree and ate the bark of that. Lots took sick and died. As Americans successfully pushed the bounds of the frontier, they not only believed that they were destined to take over the land and prosper, they believed that God was the one who put them there to do it. They believed that it was God's will, that the United States should be a continental nation, stretching from the Atlantic to the Pacific. As each wave of immigration would come, they'd move into an area. The United States would then make some sort of arrangement with the tribe to get that land from them. And then more would come, and they'd advance the frontier even further. 
the power of Manifest Destiny, of expansion, of inevitability, of God's providence, helped to rally people around not only the idea of Americans as entitled to North America, but rallied them around the idea that Indian people were barriers to civilization and barriers to progress. No matter how many treaties were signed or how much land they gave to the United States, the Indian was still in the way. This was known as the Indian problem. This so-called problem continued despite a decades-old policy to force Indians to swap their land east of the Mississippi for land west of it. The Indians would then move to those western parts and away from the Americans. This plan was simply called removal. The Removal Act was the centerpiece of Andrew Jackson's political agenda and it was very controversial at the time. It was very widely debated. There was lots of discussion across the country and very many prominent people spoke up against it. Will the American government steal? Will it lie? Will it kill? I have no desire to see the poor remnants of a once powerful people. The removal bill represents oppression with a vengeance. The removal process, it was, all right, you've made these treaties. Now, you can have one of two things. You can keep your sovereignty, but you can't keep your land. But if you keep your land, then you have to assimilate and no longer be Indian. You will have sovereignty or you have your land. You can't have both. Across the United States, the Removal Act divided the country. But across the Indian nations, reaction was unanimous. We are surrounded by white people, and there are encroachments made. What assurances have we that similar ones will not be made on us should we remove to the Mississippi? Look here, Father. Our lands belong to us. We shall keep them. We do not wish to talk to you anymore. We had already been fighting to keep that land. And sure enough, when the government was coming in there to take us out of that land, we fought even more. But at some point, you have to realize that this fighting is all gonna be about death. And death is coming. Then I need to be protecting my family. And I want my children to survive. So we have to endure this removal. Many of the tribes did choose to accept removal as a means of maintaining the tribal nation. What choice was there? After decades of engagement, they could no longer resist. And so they gave up their lands, they gave up their homes, they gave up their fields and forests, they gave up literally their way of life in order to be able to stay together and be what they were. We are poor, but we are free. No white man controls our footsteps. Some try to assimilate to avoid removal. Some were removed completely. But in the end, every nation met the same fate. Every nation had to give up land. Brothers, you cannot remain where you are now. You have but one remedy within your reach, and that is to remove to the West. May the Great Spirit teach you how to choose. The loss of land was devastating, and so was the loss of lives. The most famous of these incidents was the Cherokee Nation's Trail of Tears, but there were numerous other trails just as violent and just as crushing. Everyone had to walk. My baby brother, Joel, was four years old. I was just eight, but I took my turn at carrying him because he could not walk much. I would get so tired, I'd think I was going to die, but I would hang on to him. I was so afraid they would kill him. I saw them kill babies who were too big to be carried and would give out. That really was a road of death. People were falling on the side of the road or being shot or being murdered on the road and being left there. The removal process was done in a way that was not efficient in making people survive. Oh, 
Of the millions of Indian people that lived before the first colonists arrived, by the end of the 19th century, only 250,000 remained. The removal of a tribe was certain to destroy all of the things they knew about taking care of themselves, all of their medicines, all of their foods. Everything about them had to change in order to survive. It can only be understood as an act of destruction. When you move a people from one place to another, when you displace people, when you wrench people from their homelands, wasn't that genocide? We don't make the case that there was genocide. We know there was, yet here we are. When we were forced to leave our land, we took the fires with us. We took the embers along. Then when we got to Oklahoma, we rekindled the old fire. Old home or new home, it is the same fire. I would say, draw art up for Queen Day. And up for Day Chan Di Hakin Day. Pleasure for Queen Day. And up Ki Kwan Kwan Day. in the ring there. I'm going to go to the 
Ja, Imagine, you're about to have a little one. The love that you have for that little one. And then imagine somebody outside of your family you don't even know, making claims on your little one. They don't like the way you live, and they're gonna take your little one by force. Imagine what the loss is when this is not just your family, but your entire community loses its children. My people's continued existence depends on children being able to be who they are and know who they are and that um, transfer of knowledge to the generations, cultural knowledge, spiritual knowledge, you know, those things that make us who we are. 
You know, they look at us, they look at you, and they reflect. This is the way I'm supposed to be. Mm -hmm. Congress gives money to start boarding schools, to forcibly remove Native children as young as four and five years old from their homes and their communities, bring them thousands of miles away to an institution um, where they're forbidden to speak their language, forbidden to communicate with each other. was seen as very progressive and had a lot of support and that filtered its way into the child welfare system. You know, Native children are better off raised in white homes. You know, let's save those poor Indian kids. Growing up not knowing, even if they're Native American, it's not just about removing children, it's dismantling everything of their being in the process. That cultural assimilation and to kill the Indian to save the man, to kill the Indian in that child. Indian Child Welfare Act in 1978 was an atonement. The premise of the Indian Child Welfare Act was not to forcibly remove the children from their families, but find ways within the community, within the families, to keep them there. This law was passed and Maine in particular still had one of the highest rates of removal of Native children. We have people who are still disconnected from our communities because they were taken when they were little. We have young people in foster care now that have a story to tell. Next on Maine Watch, coming to terms with the past, Maine has become the first state in the nation to form a Truth and Reconciliation Commission focusing on child welfare. The ceremony creating the Maine Wabanaki State Child Welfare Truth and Reconciliation Commission mandate took place at the State House in the Hall of Flags. As the five tribal chiefs and Governor LePage sat down to sign the mandate, they took with them the words of Denise Altvader, who herself had been taken as a child. It's time for truth, it's time for healing, it's time for peace, and it's time for forgiveness. When they took you, did they tell you why? They never told us anything. They to just this, took you? To this day, I don't know why. The people who ran the home, I used to say that they abused us, and I now realize what they did was torture us, hmm. um, sexually abused us. You know, no one ever believes that any of this stuff ever happened. For one thing, nobody ever really talked about it. But to know that there's going to be a special commission, a place, a time, 
so that you can tell your story and that they are going to believe you that it really happened and then it's going to make a really big difference. It's going to change things. I think that is so powerful. I'm one of five commissioners mandated to discover what the truth is. Many of our people have never shared their stories. It's a total contradiction to silence. The truth hurts. The truth is very painful, very painful for us. It's the families themselves who decided to walk through the fear and to tell what happened that are making history. They're the ones making history, not us, the commissioners. We were in Indian Township meeting with the community and this woman just spoke up. How do you propose that we're supposed to be healing? When we went through that experience, we experienced that alone. We experienced it in isolation. And we've kept it that way. And then when we open it, if we open it and we're with each other, that's how we can heal amongst the circle of our relatives. I can't get over the, the nightmares. All we did was beg for our foster mother to hug us and say they loved us. My baby sister and I sat in the tub of bleach one time tried to convince each other that we're getting white. And then we knew they would accept us. Where was the state? Where was the state that was supposed, they were supposed to have been our guardians. But where were they? They weren't there for us, but we didn't know. We knew nothing else but foster people. And how come it took so long for you all to get a group together to see if they can help us. You can't heal someone that's going through hell. When we tell it, we feel it in our bodies, we feel it in our spirit, we feel it in our heart. But I also believe that we can get to that point where it has far less power over us. Part of the fear of sharing what happened to you is you relive some of that pain and by her doing what she did, she showed them that you could share it and come back. That's the perfect example of the readiness that it's time. We witnessed over the last 27 months the incredible strength of the Wabanaki people. The people of the dawn, the people of the first light. Our essential finding is that between 2002 and 2013, Native children in Maine were still five times more likely to enter foster care than non-Native children. We take these essential numbers, the disproportionate rates of removal over time, the gaps in identification, and we link them to still present realities of racism and dispossession, and we frame them as evidence of continued cultural genocide against Wabanaki people.
when we come out and acknowledge exactly what this is about, then we can start the process of healing. Then we can start the process of change. Out of the earth I sing for them, a horse nation I sing for them. Out of the earth I sing for them, the animals I sing for them. Indian horsemanship is legendary, and the survival of many native peoples, especially on the Great Plains, depended on horses. Native peoples recognized the importance of the horse by incorporating them into their cultural and spiritual lives. The value of the horse could often be seen through beautifully designed and decorated horse trappings and gear. Each tribe had different ways of expressing their identity and honoring the bravery and grace of the horse. Early saddle blankets were made from animal skins such as deer, otter, buffalo, and mountain lion. When the skins were laid over the horse's back, the legs of the animal would often hang down on each side. Later, when other materials such as cloth and canvas were used, the Lakota chose to keep the shape of the animal to honor them, which is why there are two longer strips of cloth. This Lakota style tack replicates early 20th century style horse trappings. The designs here are done with ribbon, but the typical technique was either intricate glass beadwork or porcupine quillwork. This saddle is made from wood and rawhide. The frame of the saddle is put together and then wrapped in wet rawhide and allowed to dry. Often, the pommels of the saddle were made using deer or elk antler, which naturally held the shape of the pommels. Typically, a saddle like this would be used by a woman, as it served a better function for hauling and carrying items during a move. Men might only use a blanket or a smaller padded saddle, which was less restrictive and allowed for movement during hunting or battle. The horse mask is a very special item. Made specifically for individual horses, horse masks were often decorated with very specific items and designs that were meant to imbue a certain virtue to the horse. For example, some were made of buffalo and decorated with their horns to imbue the strength and power of the buffalo to the horse. Masks were seldom worn into battle or hunts because they could obstruct the view of the horse. In the early 20th century, when parading became an important part of native cultures, masks were often worn on horses and beautifully made and decorated with intricate beadwork and quillwork. 
Each tribe valued certain colors over the others and used unique designs that differentiated themselves from others. Every August, the Absoluca Crow Nation hosts the Crow Fair, one of the largest native gatherings on the Northern Plains. The Crow Fair Parade is a dazzling display of beadwork worn by people and horses alike. This crow saddle is a distinct style used by the crow and other neighboring plateau tribes. Typically, this is a woman's saddle it is made in a similar fashion as the Lakota saddle with wood, sometimes antler, and rawhide, but then it is covered with a soft, brain-tanned leather. Often the crow would intricately bead around the pommels and stirrups. The extra high pommels are very much stylized with fringe and beads. I grew up surrounded by animals. My dad gave me my first horse when I was eight years old. My family are cattle ranchers, and rodeo is an important sport that helps develop the skills necessary on a modern-day ranch. Indians have traditionally regarded the animals in their lives as fellow creatures whom they share a common destiny. That intimate bond between human and animal is nowhere so evident or powerful as in the case of the horse. Over 200 Navajo Crow Talkers participated on the landing of Iwo Jima. 5th Marine Division were on the north side of the island. A company of Marines were pinned down real badly. They were being fired upon from three different directions. Mortar shells were being dropped down. They were hunkering desperately in the foxhole. Company commander wrote down a message asking for help, handed to a Navajo Crow Talker. This is what the Navajo Code Talker said. This is the actual message that was sent on Iwo. What does that mean? This is what he said in Navajo. Sheep, eyes, nose, Deer, destroyer, tea, mouse, turkey, onion, sick horse, three, six, two, bear. As each Navajo word came through the air, the code talker down at the beach command post, he writes it down in English. What did he write down? Send demolition team to hill 
362B. There were three hills on the north side, 362A, 362B, and 362C. Beneath 362B was the problem. This message took 20 seconds. After 20 seconds, Beach Command Post organized a rescue team to save that company of Marines. If that message was sent in English code, it would have taken 30 minutes. 20 seconds in Navajo, 30 minutes in English code. Those guys pinned down on North Side didn't have 30 minutes. Without Navajo, Marines would never have taken the island of Iwo Jima. That's how critical Navajo code was to the war in the Pacific. And we should never forget what war is. War is something that nobody wants. It's bad, it's ugly. But so long as we are together, no matter what nationality you are, if you are American and love this country, we all have to stick together to keep this nation strong. Our freedom and liberty mean so much, meant so much for those who never made it home. So it's up to us now to keep this nation strong and prosperous. When he started, some of the walls looked like, oh gosh, it's all rotten under there. I was kind of like doing a lot of internet research to see if it's even possible or if it's even worth it. Like, how do you save a house that's been deteriorating for so long? His eyes would be swollen because he would be working on a floor and he'd be on the basement and the materials would come down into his face. But I just like pray and like, just protect them today, you know, <laughs> so they're okay. She would be very proud if she could see not letting, you know, the house go down. I feel her presence here. I know that she has made things happen however way that she could because that's the type of mother that she always was. Ma's house is um, sometimes known as the Red House. Um, this is the house that I grew up in with my family. Sort of a place for visitors, a place for meals and sharing. Our grandmother, who everyone called Ma, she lived here and she, she made this how she liked it. It just became really known as Ma's house. Her name's Loretta Silva, Princess Silva Arrow. She was the princess that we loved. Just always remember her being very glamorous, loving and, and wanting just to, to always care for us. We miss her a lot. So Ma's house was built in the 1960s and the first people who lived here were Ma, uh, my grandfather, along with their six children. When I got married, my husband came here to live. And then as I had children, Kelly, Jeremy, and then my other sister and her husband, one of my nephews and their children. Like this whole space here, there were so many kids and a family. I can remember the, there'd be a pull-out couch here, but we were always happy and this was always cool. Yep, there were always different aunts, uncles, cousins. <laughs> that's a lot though. <laughs> During powwow time, that's when they almost got to be over capacity at Ma's house. Once we completed our newer house down the road and we had to move, and so for the past five years, no one has spent time at Ma's house. It was very sad to see, you know, what a once vibrant place just kind of dying off. One day, Jeremy came up with the idea, what do you think of making Ma's house into a residency? You want to step more in the frame? <laughs> you can come forward a little bit. It's like gonna. 
invite other artists in and just to keep our you know culture alive. My plan for Ma's house is that it's going to have the entire front of the house dedicated to communal arts events and history lessons and workshops. And the goal is to have a space for uh, Black, Indigenous, and people of color to have an art space. So it'll kind of be like a guest house. It'll also be my home uh, permanently. And it's just going to have a lot of different people, um, I guess in quotes, living there <laughs> all year round to pursue their own art projects. And so I want to have work on the walls that can be experimental or don't have to be for sale. What we're planning to do is have um, work mounted that's 2D on this wall. Just um, art shows that generate conversation around quality, uh, race, current issues. I've just become so proud of being Shinnecockan. I think if you would just ask someone from Southampton, they might know us for the Shinnecock uh, smoke shop for the uh, Shinnecock powwow. But one thing I really want to change through Ma's house is to actually transform the public perception of Shinnecock, where we're uh, a modern place, where we have history being celebrated. The reality is on the East End, people who grew up here their whole lives are being pushed out. We're constantly just trying to hold on to what we have, not let outside forces kind of take over our lives. The residents of Southampton kept wanting more land. They kept pushing us further and further back. And so uh, Shinnecock today only has around 800 square acres of land. As my uh, grandmother said, um, we're still here thanks to this um, little peninsula surrounded by water because there was just no more land for us to be pushed back to. Nowadays, we try to say nation instead of reservation because reservation is such a colonial way of thinking. It's the land of our ancestors. We've always lived here. So, so many people that come here for the first time think they're lost or they don't think that there's gonna be any houses down here. <laughs> There was so much generosity around Ma's house when I first started. Um, people were either sharing the uh, crowdfunding campaign and people would be offering donations from individuals. We have a check for you. Oh, wow. 500. Oh, my goodness. Oh, that's so wonderful. Different friends have come down, different relatives have also come and worked. Roger Waters, who was a uh, Pink Floyd band member, who donated a beehive. Other people have been donating house plants. Some people have been donating uh, greens that are edible. Just here at, late at night sometimes, it kind of feels like you're not really alone whether that's um, the creaky floors or just like the draft coming through different cracks in the house. I like to also think that family members who passed on but spent time at Ma's house are still there in some form, kind of approving things that are going on there. Now that I'm taking care of the house itself, I think that the house will take care of me down the line.
Arlington is very small. I mean, it's not a very big town, but you know, it's my hometown. I just love it to death. <laughs> He's so little. My name is Neja Knight. I am 13. 14. <laughs> my bad. It's an easy mistake to make on your actual birthday. I'm excited. And everyone's throwing you a party. Hello, thank you. 14, huh? Yes, ma'am. And in a lot of ways, Neja Knight is a very typical teenager. This is my turtle toodles. Her favorite food is Indian tacos. And it's so, so good. I love it. Her favorite color is turquoise. Oh, snap. And it's my color. <laughs> Her favorite cake is chocolate. Happy birthday to you. <laughs> but she has an outsized passion for the number eight. You have to ride them for the full eight seconds. You can't touch the ground, and you have to have at least part of the rope in your hand for you to make it. There you go. I am a mini bull rider. They might be called mini bulls, but they're still pretty big. They're kind of just like a smaller breed, and they're fully grown, and they weigh to 500 to 1,000 pounds, I think, but somewhere in there. And, yeah. and how much do you weigh? I weigh 80 pounds. <laughs> With Sean presented with the plaque, Naja, so glad to have you here with us. Right now, I am ranked number seven. That would be in the world. And if that's not impressive enough, she's also the only girl competing with a whole lot of boys. Most of the time, they're very nice and they just accept you. But sometimes, they'll be like, so I can't get beat by a girl. But, you know, you just got to show them who's boss. This go. boss has been doing that in and out of the arena. She's been featured in Vogue magazine and appeared on the Kelly Clarkson show. She's got product endorsements, a modeling contract, and even her own trading cards. But for Neja, all of this is run up to her real goals. Well, my short time is to be at number one in the world champion, <laughs> but my longtime goal is to be the first girl in the PBR. Here we go. PBR stands for Professional Bull Riders. Not only are the men involved in the most dangerous sport in the world. And if it's not the most dangerous sport in the world, it's definitely one of them. To get there, neja has got to stay in the game till she's 18. Four more years. The woman of the PBR. She's a woman of the In January 2020, she not only became the first girl to ride a bull at Madison Square Garden, she also beat all her competitors in the third round. But just as her star was on the rise, the COVID-19 pandemic hit. I had rodeos almost every month. So, I mean, it canceled a lot of my rodeos. That was a big disappointment. Instead, Neja and her coach, also known as Dad, do their best to stay rodeo ready. We try to work out five days a week. I think, if anything, <laughs> we probably went harder through that and just kind of blocks out everything else and just focus on what you got to do and, and you just get it done. You need to tend these. Mostly we work on lifting light, to keep the muscles toned, but able to be flexible to move with the board. Good job. Great. All right. You want to be able to meet each move and be right there on top of him. So if he decides to change his mind, you're able to snap back into the next position. He would know. Great. Andrew Knight's been riding in rodeos since he was a kid and still competes now and then. She used to go to every rodeo with me and nice work. She'd be back there and I'd be getting ready and she wanted to always get on something. I mean, when she was three years old, she's like, Dad, can you put me on? Can you put me on? And I'm like, no, you're too little. You know, your time will come. Your turn also. 
<laughs> I'm like, you best put me on one because <laughs> I just fell in love with it. So I finally decided you know, I put her on and from there on there was really no holding her back. There you go. Here we go, folks. Like a lot of young riders, Neja started on sheep, a sport known as mutton busting. She was a champion mutton buster. I mean, she just gripped on there like Velcro and there wasn't no getting her off. Oh, oh, thank you. Then oh, came calves you. and steers <laughs> and now mini bulls, something she found out about from her great uncle Jim. Okay, the horse is here. Bulls I wasn't too sure about because she was awful tiny, but she stuck it out. She's a tough little girl. Here we go! I haven't broken any bones from bull riding yet, thank goodness, but I have got stepped on a couple times. I also had my spur caught in my handle before, so I was like upside down on the bull. I didn't have my boot straps on that time, and so my boot slid off. And I finally got off the bull, and I was like, it's a good thing I didn't wear my bootstraps today. <laughs> Let me tell you something. This young lady took a big time shot last night. I was really impressed. Every parent worries about their kid getting hurt. My stomach goes up and down probably every rodeo. But she gives a wave every time. No matter if she's hurt or not, she'll let them know she's all right. I know if it's my time, then it's my time. But. It's not my time yet, so I'm doing pretty good. Jesus is blessing me, thank goodness. So, yeah, I, I'm not afraid to get back on at all. I'm just, you know, perfectly fine and ready to ride. Doesn't matter about your gender. Be cowboy. She doesn't have any fear, which is a big factor. And she got a lot of people to talk to, so it makes it easier behind the shoots. That fearless streak runs deep on Nasia's maternal side. Rodeo's been a part of our life for as long as I can remember. Her great-great-grandpa was a world champion bronc, bareback and bronc rider, Erwin Weezer, and then Bunny Weezer, her great-grandpa. And he was a champion bronc rider, three different states, Nevada, Oregon, California. And I rode the PRCA and the Indian rodeo circuits, and done pretty good myself. My son is still riding. We just grew up, everybody. We all rodeoed. And she's right in the middle of it, and she's a legacy coming up. Thanks, Uncle. Part of that legacy is her Paiute ancestry, a heritage she hopes to represent someday in the PBR Global Cup. There's two American teams, Team Eagles and then Team Wolves, which is the natives. I would be part of the Team Wolves, because I am native. And I think that would be yeah, so cool. If she keeps going and keeps focused right, there's a good chance she can do it. She got the potential and the love for the sport. She got a lot of backup. Her cousins think she's great. And doing what she does, her mom and dad are really proud of her, and I'm really proud of her. And my wife and I, we're really proud of her, the, what she's becoming, and how she's opening up doors for other women to do, you know, pretty much anything they want. Right now, Neja's attention is focused on the next four years, playing out eight seconds at a time. Make some noise for Nyjah Knight from Arlington, Oregon. Brook Singers and the Shaw Dancers. How about that? Little Eagles, you got the rabbit dance. Are we ready?
when I was growing up. I knew it was different. I could tell by the skin that I was different. But I had to put it in my head. Brown means that it's not good. My foster parents told us about run if you see an Indian, and we did it. When I was 30 years old and I went back to the reservation, this Indian lady told me, Georgina, you look exactly like your mother when she was a young person. So that made me feel pretty special, made me feel real. There's mom right here, God rest her soul, right there she was. And I kind of favor her, look at that. She always got into the dancing and stuff like that. And I love the dancing. Here she is, right here. There I am when I was graduated from high school. I don't have one when I was a little girl. They're saying that the state should have had pictures of us. Mm -hmm when they took us, but I've never seen anything. No one ever said anything to me about it. The other night I was fooling around and I was trying to draw a small girl, but I can't get the cheeks on the baby, little kids. You know how they have chubby cheeks? And so I try to do this picture here to make it a little girl. And Dan, the caption is, and here's the moccasins down here. All ready to go, and then I put where to the dance and pass them a quaddy. And so when I get depressed, I get upset, I go to one of my books here and I journal. And then I walk and go down the lake down here. We get a lake, and I walk around the lake because that's what my doctor said I should do. In my spirit, I take me out of here. That's the way the Indians used to do it, what they didn't like where they were at. They, they had a way of removing their spirit. They call it spacing. <laughs> so much you can do out here in the woods. I see little fishes in there. Wherever you see them coming up, they're getting, coming up for breath. I just love this. your mama. Oh no. Where is his mama?
I've got to learn to forgive myself for going through all the hell I went through. My counselor says, Georgina, get a picture of a baby. Because, see, I never could tell you what I look like or anything. Get a picture of a baby and forgive yourself for what you've let your little Georgina go through. When a counselor talks about that little girl, forgive yourself for what you went through. I tried. And I couldn't protect her. I couldn't protect her. That pain is still in me. I could see that all now. I could see us standing in that shed and him there. And we had to call him dad, whether he abused us or not. We had to call him dad. And it was when we were so small that we figured that's a norm. And I tried to do things to try to wipe it out, you know, kind of put it over here. And it just keeps coming back. So when he tells me to get over it, and forget about it and forgive the people that have done that. And you just can't. I try. It's, it's, I one, it's one thing you, you, you're letting past you here. It's the burden that you're carrying. And it's pushing you down all the time. If you let it go, you don't carry that burden no more. You don't go back and hang around and hang around and hang around. You keep moving ahead. But that's no... That's the way, that's just the way I was taught. Yeah, that's the way you were taught. Your brothers and sisters have been taught like that. But you don't inflict that on somebody else. It's not being inflicted. Try it. Maybe it's better than what you're doing. Yeah, we used to... But it's, it's all rock. Yeah, but we used to kick and splash in there. This here's Fort Street. That's Boynton right there. Is that the one you want? The street we lived on. Yeah. I remember I used to come in here and go right in there and go up. I can't remember how there it was is a stair, now. There, there was a stairway there. Yeah. Yeah. I can remember my mother-in-law talking about the folks that lived there and having all the foster kids and that they had you there more to work and for the money they were getting yeah. than, than because That's they really shame. cared about you. Uh, which is a shame. God well, bless you. Thank you for letting us come in You're here. very welcome. I'm trying to get all the memories I can. I don't blame you. These are some measurements, some of your physical measurements at the time. Your height. 
Well, Would you like to look I'll at some think. of your testing? <laughs> yeah, let's see some of our tests. The butcher sells one beef, two cedar, three pencils, and four glasses. He sold number one, beef. Right? You had it right back then, too. <laughs> like she wants to tell me something. And uh, if I study her long enough, her little eyes might bring something to me, you know? Between <laughs> Ado ade shin sto tenne igi aro kuya in le na da in le da thapan ho Ko kat e ya han to chon igon kwaya in to to ba ho zinda u u yo yel tis na ha nas lin ko e e kut o e Nigel, uh, it's just that, um, it's 
Sie ist ein bisschen so die Lava, ich habe sie auch gehört. Aita, ich habe auch ein Jahr gegessen. Growing up, I was more into the rodeo scene, so I was riding horses quite a bit. Mountain biking on the res, you just don't see it very often. And when I first started, I, I didn't know anybody that was riding mountain bikes. Where I live, it's very secluded. Just family here, no, nobody else. And we live on top of a hill, so everything's just right outside my doorstep. The terrain, it's one side, it's clay, it's steep, it has rocks, and it's more challenging. Then the other side, it's more dirt. So it's a lot faster, you can build more jumps on it. Our family, they're really cautious about the land with what happens to it. So like even like a little bush that you run over or take out, it, it has some sort of effect. We take a lot of that into consideration whenever we're building trails. When I first rode a bike, I think I was maybe fifth grade, and there was this big hill, and I told myself, I'm going to ride down this hill. That's where I got hooked. <laughs> When I'm riding, it frees me from whatever's going on day to day. Just the noises that comes from the bike, like the tires rolling over stuff. When you're in the air, it's just silence. It just sort of clears my mind. And then you land again. You come back into reality. The best way to get faster is to ride with better, faster people. Sheepdog is kind of our bigger group. And it's mainly the people who we ride with the most. That's how we really started to really get this mountain biking scene going. We all grew up in these areas and we always talked about that, you know, as a kid, building trails, riding our bikes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah. here we are, you know, we're doing it. Clear those rocks right there too, so you have a better clear. And I think that's what's really cool is you get reacquainted with the land out here. told us, hey, I want to do enduro. And I was like, all right, well, what's enduro? And he showed us and it was like, you know, just people <laughs> free riding down the mountain and just rocks and jumps and everything. And I was like, boy, that looks like fun, okay. And then along the way, I started riding and I got hooked and that was it. <laughs> All of a sudden, Nigel just said, we're gonna have a race here. 
let's just do it. And I was like, okay, let's go then. What's so important about riding with my friends right now is just being there for each other, you know? So that's the best thing, is just smiling for me. Just smiling, riding, having fun with the friends. Welcome to the first annual Hard Rock Fred Duro event. It's our first time. Woo! Three, two, one. What I appreciate about Nigel is, you know, his story is not written. He has the ability to reshape our futures based off his involvement in our community. And that's good to have these children be involved in our community because that's, that's what all is all we want. When you have a family that's traditional or culturally intact, it's, it's, it's kind of grounding because you get a sense of purpose. People have been fighting for hundreds of years, and that's why we're still here. We still have our culture, we still have our language, because we never gave up. Especially in mountain biking, there's a sense of pride when they ask you, where do you come from? When did you start riding? And you can tell them, I'm a Diné, I'm racing out here. I come from the Navajo Nation. What do I see for Nigel? I see this bike taking him places. That's what I see for him. That's what the bike has, you know. <laughs> Our people, the net people have a, a, a real strong connection to uh, the sacred animal, the horse. And my grandpa, he told me um, a story about the horse. And he says it's the, the foundation of, of, of life, of life. Ina, the Tessale. The horse teaches you. It teaches you yourself, who you are, your attitude, your body language. That horse can read it. So how you act, that horse is gonna be the same way Our relatives, our ancestors, grandmas, grandpas, they travel long ways on these trails on horseback. And so when the bike, we feel it, feeling the terrain and that freedom, you know, it has the same feeling as riding that horse. he can provide and make a life for himself, bringing people in a circle, like what the wheels of these bikes do. These wheels of bikes, they revolve, they, they go in revolutions like that. And we do.
Third time's a charm. Keep missing. I'm probably not even going to hit it. That's good. You're alive. Uh, like I know this is bad, but. Ow! Ow! Stop! Fine! Let me help you. This is gonna hurt. Ashima and Storm. They're sisters. They're members of the Wampanoag tribe. Hey, girls. The girls live typical lives in Massachusetts. They go to school. They ride bikes. They hang out and have fun. But sometimes they get to do something very special. They show others what life was like for their people 400 years ago. That's what some members of the tribe do at the Wampanoag home site. Let's go for a visit. 
We'll step back in time as the girls show us what life was like for the Wampanoag people in the 1620s. The Wampanoag have been living in the Northeast for thousands of years. They were the group of people that the Pilgrims met when they first arrived in America in 1620. Here we are at the home site. The sun rises. It's time to wake up. The family is cozy in their Witu. A Witu is a Wampanoag home made of branches and tree bark. It's a warm, clear day. The girls go outside and have some breakfast. Their sister cooks it over an open fire. They eat in a sump, which is hot corn porridge. They sweeten their nasamp with berries. They're a little thirsty. Time to get a drink. A spring runs through the home site. The girls dip hollowed out gourds into the water and fill them up. The water is cool and fresh. Parents encourage kids to run around, play, and have fun. The girls love to play a game called double ball. Nice catch! Kids also help the adults out with chores. The Wampanoag grow corn. Big flocks of blackbirds want to eat the corn. The girls climb up high and yell and shout at the blackbirds. They're like human scarecrows. They scare those hungry birds away. Time for a break. The girls pick some sumac berries with their dad. Then they brew them into a delicious hot tea. I liked it. <laughs> One more cup, please. The Wampanoag live by a river. The girls take a ride on a machine to visit friends up the river. Machine is the Wampanoag word for boat. It's made from a tree trunk. Back at the home site, the girls grind some corn for stew. Each girl gets a turn. It's a chore, but it's also pretty fun. Yep. Their mom cooks quail over the fire. She'll put it into the stew. Looks scrumptious. The girls relax by making some beads out of clay. They'll make them into necklaces. Storm shapes one of her beads into a spiral. It's been a long, busy day. The girls are getting tired and the sun is going down. They play with dolls before bedtime.
and then they cuddle up and go to sleep. Their bare fur blankets are so warm and soft. Good night, girls. Tashima and Storm love showing what life was like for the Wampanoag long ago. But they also love being typical modern day kids. <laughs> I have soil in my hand, underneath my fingernails. I feel different. Mm -hmm. I feel like I'm where I'm supposed to be at. Working on the land, I don't have to think about people looking at me a certain type of way. It's way deeper than just a line of work. When I went to school, I studied conservation resource studies. That was the name of my major. And I got to form it around sustainable farming, agroecology, indigenous foodways. I just felt an inherent connection to nature. If you really want to help the earth in the biggest way, look at how people are growing their food. Look how people are literally using most of the earth. As the pandemic happened, a lot of organizations were learning the importance of growing food and having a distribution base. When that happened, we were doing a lot of work with Segorite members. I don't like spikes. It's not spiky. It's good for you. Put on your skin, moisturize your skin. Put it on your face before you go to bed. You can put it on your, on your body like that. Yeah, you can moisturize your body. I work for the Segorite Land Trust. We're an urban indigenous woman-led land trust based in the Bay Area. We refer to this area as Huchin, and we're mainly based in the village of Lashan, which is present-day East Oakland. Yeah, Najoni is great. Definitely one of the people I got closer to within Segorite first. I know that they really are here to support indigenous and black youth. I've learned a lot from Will. When to plant things, what plants like to be next to each other, what plants like to have their space. It's pretty important to ground yourself. It could be planting your feet in the soil. You want some gloves? Yes. It could be saying a prayer. By being able to work with these plants, it's fostering a healing space but also making sure that we understand the greater work that we're doing. My dad came from the Navajo Nation and my mom grew up in East Palo Alto. 
My parents met in Oakland. Growing up, we had limited access to green spaces. The majority of the time we lived in apartments, so there wasn't much space to do your own garden. A large part of my work has to do with education. We talk about calling on all generations and all walks of life to really take part in this work that is transforming the legacy of colonization. We're trying to make sure that our communities can sustain themselves. We are focused on rematriating the land. To have access to places where we can grow food, medicines, pray, dance, and gather together. There are like more than 200 varieties of, of corn before. I believe that. Now there's only like 50? A lot of varieties just die off if no one's growing them. When I hear words like regenerative organic, Ultimately, all of that comes from indigenous practices that have been passed down. Soil is everything. We don't use any chemicals or pesticides. We don't believe in monoculturing. But we like to diversify our field. We like to think about the pollinators, think about the bees, think about the butterflies. When the winter season is here, when the capacity to grow food and to be on the land isn't as present, we put the field to rest, but also regenerate it through certain crops and seeds. And then when it is time to grow food, we cut it down. It decomposes more nutrients back into the earth. If you talk about composting, cover cropping, no-till agriculture that's been going on for thousands of years, it's really just stuff that we're trying to come back to. We're trying to make sure that our communities are able to tap into that self-agency and be resilient. If regenerative agriculture does become the norm, I hope that it's, it's with the motive of the people, you know, for the earth. It's really seen as the solution and not just a, a temporary trend. Many California tribes are not federally recognized. Some of them are seen as extinct. If you look at the history of colonization, not just for Native people, but for Black people, it's not that long ago. So many Indigenous people have been invisibilized and erased through time, and seeing the connections of that with food and with land, it's very clear. The current industrial agriculture system is oppressive because that's what it was based on. Colonization, slavery. There are systemic problems that are structural and actually written in law that are racist. As someone who has experienced a lot of racial oppression, people are seeing now from the Black Lives Matter movement that we still have a lot of trauma today and 98% of farmland is owned by white people coming to the land and when I show up to the farm as a black farmer, as a black person, that's an act of resistance. But being on land in a way that's actually healing and addressing trauma and pain is revolutionary. When we're at the farm in present day Albany, these are village sites. These are burial sites, they're sacred places, and we should treat it as such. Sigorte has done a lot to contribute to my understanding of respecting the land and being actually present on the land. When I show up, the first thing I do isn't just start working. I have to tap in with the altar to say a prayer. That helped awaken something that was already inherently inside of me. And I think all of us have a connection in that way. By having the land trust, Sigorite is able to do rematriation. 
matriation is saying, give the mother back the earth. You're giving the indigenous people the land back. The work that we're doing is to ensure that the generations after us will have a place to live. We're encouraging people how to be in right relationship with others. More thoughtful of what we're doing to the earth. Figuring out ways that we can respect traditional practices and in indigenous communities and recognize that this knowledge is just as important as your published science journal. It's really having land spaces that aren't just thinking about how we can shift agriculture, but how can we shift our world viewpoint. Hello folks, welcome to the Old State House and to the Governor's Council Chamber. This is the oldest public building in Boston. I've had dreams before about our ancestors running through the woods. Didn't know what we were running from. I bring my children in this room because they can see these dark things, but they know that there's a real strength and resilience in our people. Charlie, do you understand why we're here today? Uh, because we, we want to be on TV. <laughs> that has a lot to do with this proclamation here, Charlie. No. So what do you think about this word right here? Perfidious. He probably meant uh, wild and dirty or horrible. These orders came from the government. They were sick of our tribe resisting colonization and not following rules. Most times, the rules of engagement for wars and stuff like that, kids aren't supposed to be killed. It's easier to uh, feel comfortable with killing other people in wars or um, in, in genocidal acts when you see them as less than human. This proclamation was written a long time ago. They declared the Penobscot people enemies. And then he died? Yeah, a lot of our ancestors. That's why this paper exists. Does it make you feel anything actually being here? It makes me realize like how resilient our people are and how like we're, we're still here. A proclamation. Whereas the tribe of Penobscot Indians have repeatedly, in a perfidious manner, acted contrary to their solemn submission unto His Majesty long since made and frequently renewed. I have therefore thought fit to issue this proclamation and to declare the Penobscot tribe of Indians to be enemies, rebels, and traitors of His Majesty King George II. And I do hereby require His Majesty's subjects of this province to embrace all opportunities of pursuing, captivating, killing, and destroying all and every of the aforesaid Indians. For every male Penobscot Indian above the age of 12 years old, 50 pounds. 
business. In today's money, that's like $12,000. For every scalp of a male Penobscot Indian above the age aforesaid, brought in as evidence of their being killed as aforesaid, 40 pounds. For every female Penobscot Indian taken and brought in as aforesaid, 25 pounds. For every scalp, scalp of such female Indian or male Indian under the age of 12 years that shall be killed and brought in as evidence of their being killed as foresaid. 20 pounds. 20 pounds on what? Two pounds is like dollars. <laughs> I'd be sold. Yep. They had trading posts where um, people would bring bags of these scalps or they would bring bodies of Penobscot people and they would tally them up just like if they were animal skins and they would get money for them. You would sell me? I wouldn't sell you. The government told the colonists to go do this. A female Penobscot Indian was worth half as much as a man. That's patriarchy right there. We weren't seen as people. We were seen as, as animals, basically, in that um, you could quantify based on the, the size of us. There was this study. They put these mice into mazes they traumatized them by giving them an electrical shock. But before they issued the electrical shock, they sprayed orange blossom scent. What the scientists found was that those mice who had been traumatized, their kids and their grandkids and their great-grandkids all had the same traumatic response to orange blossom, even though they had never been given an electrical shock with it. The memory of being hunted like this is in our blood, and it still scares us. Yeah. This proclamation, which is essentially a call to exterminate the Penobscot people uh, through hunting and scalping and murdering, was signed in this very room that we are sitting in. They tried to bury us, but they didn't know that we were seeds. Anybody got a lighter?
I grew up here in Hakipu'u. We're on the windward side of Oahu. Growing up here was a large part of my identity. We trace our genealogy back to this, this same place on this same aina that our kupuna walked on before us. This place for us, it's the beginning, you know, it's the middle, it's where we will eventually rest in the land here. The Ivi Kupuna on that aina is Ino Ino and Paku. Um, Ino Ino is my fifth great grandfather. Paku was his wahine. Ivi Kupuna, it means the bones, skeletal remains of our ancestors. But it's not just that. The spiritual being of that person, their uhane, which is their spirit, is still in the Ivi in the bones, so when we bury them in the aina, in the soil, their spirit, their mana is still there. I feel like that definitely gives that aina and that place power. And I think when we connect to that aina, we're not just connecting to the aina, we're connecting to the ancestors that are in that aina and the knowledge that they carried and that they've, you know, absorbed into it. The fact that many people nowadays don't really understand why Ibi Kupuna is important is that numbing, you know, like we're numb to the purpose or sacredness of things anymore. When you are closely tied to Ivi Kupuna or burials, and you know them, you know where they are, the understanding of our responsibility to them and them to us is very real. Hold your hand. Yeah, read both. Okay. Right next door to us is Kualoa. Kualoa was seen as the seat of our ea, of our sovereignty. Whatever chief had control of Kualoa had much power. So it's very interesting in that you have a missionary family that is now controlling Kualoa and acquiring all the lands in Ka'awa, Kualoa, and now the lands here in Hakipu'u. 95% of Hakipu'u has become part of Kualoa Ranches holdings or no longer in the hands of the native tenants. So there are just remnant Kuleana lands existing here and the Fukumitsu family are one of the few families that still have their Kuleana lands. Kulo Ranch had purchased property down the road more, and we had made them aware that the Ivi Kupuna, my ancestors, are buried there. And to please beware and contact us in whatever they're doing. They did not. They went and decided to grade and grub large areas, take down large trees, uproot, 
you know, whatever plants were around. And the next day we went to make a stand. We set our stage to make known the place is sacred and we took a physical stand. Protecting my kids, protecting my Ivi Kupuna. We sat in the road and we made sure that construction wouldn't happen. Let me ask you this. If, if the ranch or Mr. Morgan can... The police trying to mediate between, you know, us, the lineal descendants, and Kulo Ranch. I'm sorry, I know you guys are just doing your job, but this is our kids' safety and the safety of our Ivi Kupuna. And so we were arrested. It was me and my neighbor Ian Masterson were arrested for protecting the Ivi Kupuna and historic sites. After I was arrested and taken away, Kulo Ranch was business as usual. Had their employees down there doing what they were doing the whole time. And it was very clear that two people could be moved easily. We love you guys. Bye, Dad. Love you. But, you know, if you put a kahea and you have the lahui help, it's a lot more strength because it's harder to move a hundred people than two. It was a relief for, for me and my ohana because it helped us in our stand because we weren't alone. And with all of that support, Kulo Ranch decided that they couldn't fight the Lahui and what they were standing for, so they decided to hold off for two weeks. Eating the kahea, we really, really, really malama everybody for that. Why is it that Hawaiian burials don't receive the same treatment as burials in the cemetery? They said, you know, we don't want our children to inherit this struggle. And then I could feel the sadness in the land, and I realized that they were carrying that hurt, that burden, that that the kupuna felt. And so I, I told them, a lot of times we pull upon the mana, you know, the power of our ancestors to guide us. We walk on the land, we present ourselves with humility and we ask for their wisdom. And we feel their presence with us. <laughs> But now the kupuna need our help and they're pulling upon our essence and our mana to help them to transition into po, into eternity. Because they're, they're trapped by their sadness and we need to show them that we are there for them, that we will protect their bones. And so I, I told Summer and Kolea, have your son chant the genealogy of your family. O kau kava hine, no ho pulawa ahana ia o ino ino hekane no hakipu. And lend your mana as their mo'opuna, as their descendants, to say it's okay, we're gonna be okay. We are going to bring the breath and our life back into this place. And you don't need to worry anymore.
go to the last time. So you walk down. Before we clear it up. Yeah, on the face, there's the yeah. springs coming out. So you're going to put it right on the face, but a little bit above the water. And so that day when they walked the Aina was really about returning the gifts, you know, giving back to our kupuna in the, in the gifts that they have enriched us with. It's dry. It's usually coming out here. This is our main spring that gives us gives us water down below. And so, you know, you always gotta respect what was given to you. If you cannot protect the land, forget it. And if you cannot protect the ancestors that we have that connection to in order to help us to return to ourselves and know what is right and what is pono. If you cannot hold on to that mana and preserve the memory of our kupuna, not just in our minds, but the memory that they give this land so that they can teach us how to return to that place of pono and that place of abundance, then we lose everything. Many Hawaiians are homeless. Many Hawaiians have been literally evicted from their ancestral lands. You see here in Hakipu'u, 95% of the lands are lost. You know? So that means all those families left the valley or they perished by the epidemics. To unearth our kupuna in the ground is like the final eviction. Like, we cannot even have our own ancestors rest peacefully. I could feel that part of the work that Kolel and Summer does is they, they nurture and nourish this land and they take that poison out. If we are to restore that ea and that pono, you know, back to Hawaii, it's imperative that Kanaka begin to come back to this place and breathe life back into this Aina. And the way that we can connect to that glorious past where the chiefs walk proudly and where the kahuna guided us with wisdom is we have to preserve their ivy. Native people have been living here in the Connecticut River Valley of western Massachusetts for more than 10,000 years.
This is the homeland of many first people, all related to one another. They are called the Sokoki, Pokomtuk, Nonotuk, Warnoko, and Agawam. This homeland includes the towns of modern-day Northfield, south to Long Meadow, from Holland in the east, and to Roe in the west. There are many other tribes who visited and still visit this native homeland. Among them are the Abenaki, Nipmuc, Wampanoag, Narragansett, Mohegan, Pequot, Mohican, and Mohawk. These tribes are recognized today by states or the federal government as sovereign nations. Historically, tribes gathered in this valley to trade, to fish, to plant, to participate in sacred ceremonies, to reunite with family, and perhaps to find a spouse. Where are the Pocomtuck, Nanatuck, Warrenoko, and Agawam peoples today? During the wars waged in the colonial period, they were driven from this valley. They blended into the Abenaki, Nipmuc, and Mohican tribes across the northeast. When danger passed, some came back to their homeland in the Connecticut River Valley. Often, they integrated into the settler communities. Some were herbal doctors, basket makers, and carvers. They dressed like their European descendant neighbors, but they kept their culture alive. Much has been written about the last of the indigenous people in the Northeast, that they are gone and extinct. This is not true. Native people had children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Their spirits, their memory, and their descendants are still here, living among us. We invite you to listen to some of these stories. First, I want to say thank you to all the elders, to all the people who have passed on the stories and the history and the culture through the generations. Thank you. It's important to remember that European people have only been here for 400 years. Native people, Indian people, indigenous people have been here for 10,000 years. When you're learning about Native people, it's important to think about when are you talking about. Pre-contact means before the Europeans came here. Then we have the time when the Europeans came here, and we have today. Native people are still here. In learning about what was life like here before the Europeans came here, 
Try to erase everything. Erase all the roads, all the cars, all the trucks, all the buildings, all the grocery stores, okay? Grocery stores do not exist. What you have is a homeland. So the homeland would go, say, to Putney, Vermont, to Worcester, Mass, down to Hartford, Connecticut, to the Hoosick Range in New York. This is homeland. This is homeland shared by many, many people. Now the Indian people, their tribal names often mean the people. There weren't any other people here. For thousands and thousands of years, it was just Indian people. It was Indian people that lived at Pakumtuk, which is the place where there's a swift, shallow, sandy stream. Or the Indian people that lived at Peskiomska, which is the place where the rock splits and the red flames are coming out of the water. In this homeland, you had places where there was giant cornfields. Giant, giant cornfields. People went to the cornfields to plant. Then you had places like Peskiomska, which is now Turner's Falls, or Great Falls, where the fish are so plentiful that at certain times of the year you go there to fish. This land was full of food because of the way native people used it. They shared it and they tended it. It was not a wilderness. They had to get to the different places at the right time of the season to harvest the cranberries and the berries and the nuts. They had groves of nut trees. When the Europeans came here, they did not move into a wilderness. The cornfields were already cleared. The roads were already paths. Besides the Warrenoko and Agawam and Nipmuc and Pukumtuk and Abenaki, also the Wampanoags from the east part of Massachusetts, they had a lot to do with here. The Narragansetts from the ocean to the south had a lot. The Mohawks from the New York area, they would come here to travel, to trade, to visit family, to fish. So this land was occupied by lots and lots of Native people. Native people made fences to help them hunt, fences that came into a V. And then people would get together and go way behind where it's a mile apart and make noise and drive the deer to the V where your hunters would be at the V. Remember, there's no grocery stores, no 7-Eleven. And they would hunt the deer that way. They did this also on the rivers, where there's like a basket across the river made of stonework, stick work in a V. So that the fish coming down the river are all funneled into this place. They're called weirs. We made what we needed out of bark containers for harvesting, for storing food. We covered our wigwams with bark. Bark is also how we stored our food. Some of the food storage pits were as big as inside this wigwam. We made canoes out of big logs called dugout canoes. There are accounts of the Pukumtuk traveling by dugout canoe to Fisher's Island which is off the coast of Connecticut, Long Island. And they went down there to get shellfish, clams. The clam beds were sometimes a mile long. They were so full of clams that when you walked across, you got showered with water from the clams. We also have stone ceremonial features that are all over this land. Native people were also excellent astronomers. They knew the stars. They kept the calendars also with these stone ceremonial features. There was a very sophisticated culture here. In the 1700s, there were many native people who could speak English, French, their native language, and surrounding native languages. Native people had a, and, and many still do, a real knowledge of the different herbs and how they heal bodies. The native people before the Europeans came here were so healthy 
living over a hundred was common. So now I want to talk a little bit about differing worldviews. So at this time, 1600s, let's look at how Native people viewed things compared to how the people in Europe viewed things. Many peoples in Europe had been oppressed for many, many years. The Irish, the Scottish, the Welsh. They were earth-centered people who were conquered by the Romans and had to live a different way, had to go away from their traditional life ways and were now subjects. So let's start out with how people viewed land. Massasoit was a great sachem of Massachusetts. A sachem is a rock person, not somebody that ruled, somebody that everybody loved and depended on. And you give some of what you have to the sachem, not to make the sachem richer, but the sachem's going to make sure that everybody's taken care of. If they are poor or elderly, the sachem redistributes wealth. So here's what Massasoit said about land. What is this thing you call property? It cannot be the earth, for the land is our mother, feeding all her children, fish and birds and beasts and people, all the streams, the forests are for everyone to use. How can one person say it belongs only to them? To Native people, when you harvest something, you have to think about the next seven generations when you harvest to make sure that it's there again for the next season and the next season. The European attitude was more, get all you can before somebody else does. As far as women, Native women could have a career. If they divorced their husband, they were not ostracized, they were not impoverished. European women could not have a career, they could not own land. They were actually the property of their husband. The Native leaders were greatly loved by the people. They mainly facilitate discussions, bring people to consensus. The European leaders were kings who wanted domination, superiority, and obedience. So European key leaders were not necessarily loved, more feared and obeyed. As far as religion, in the native way, difference and variety is an asset. Difference and variety. Think about all the different kind of trees and the different kind of berries. What if there was just one kind of berry? How boring. Difference is excellent. To Europeans in religion, if you had a different idea about religion, you could be put to death for having a different idea about religion. Anybody with a different idea about religion was considered threatening. So ways of thinking were suppressed. In, with Native people, Native people are free. The Europeans were subjects of their king. They were serfs. European people couldn't go out and hunt a deer and feed their family. That what, the, the, in Europe, the, everything in the forest belonged to the king. Native people lived by this sharing, by reciprocity, giving back. These were completely different ways of thinking about things. The other thing that's so different and still persist today in Native traditions. Nobody is more important than anybody else. Everybody is important. 
In European culture, you have a hierarchy of importance. The Europeans that came here were taught by their religious leaders that if a person is not Christian, they're not really human. And that's why you could kill them and take their land. And if their land is not made into farms in the European way, it's up for grabs. That's what the leaders told the European people. There are many speeches by native people saying to the European dignitaries, when you were weak and we were strong, we helped you, we brought you corn, we kept you from starving. We didn't kill you or run you out like we could have. Now we are weak and you are strong. We want you to treat us like we treated you. The Wampanoags have this speech, the Mohicans have this speech um, in trying to get European people to share this land. So when things got really bad, Massasoit's son met a comet, King Philip gathered a bunch of people together, many, many different tribes, and he gave this speech. Brothers, you see this vast country before us that the Great Spirit gave to our fathers and us, that all our council fires and customs are disregarded. The treaties made by our forefathers and us are broken, and all of us are insulted. Our brothers are murdered before our eyes. Brothers, the people from this unknown world will cut down our groves, spoil our hunting and planting grounds, and drive us and our children from the graves of our fathers and enslave our women and children. This was Metacomet's call. We've got to do something. And what he tried to do was get the tribes together and force the English out of here force them back to the sea so that they would go back to their homeland. But not all the native tribes allied themselves with King Philip. Some of those native tribes said we are friends of the English. We trade with the English. We want to live more in the English way. What happened is that even though some of the tribes were with the English, the English began to see all Indian people as the enemy, across racial lines. Some of the Nipmucks who befriended the English were captured and sent to Deer Island without enough food or shelter. In the 1700s, there were many native dignitaries who went to Europe for the purpose of learning European law, to learn how to better deal with the European invasion. In 1735, a group of 140 native leaders requested a conference with the Massachusetts governor in Deerfield. They requested a school, a trading post, in the town of Stockbridge. This 140 dignitaries were Abenaki, Pecumtuck, Warrenoko, Mohican, Mohawk, working together to provide their kids with what they needed for a better life, the Deerfield Conference. In the 1700s, there was a proclamation by the Abenaki people, Attawaneto, and Atacuando relayed this message to the English people. Brothers, we tell you that we seek not war. We want nothing better than to be at peace with you English. And it depends only on you English to have peace with us. We have not yet sold the lands we inhabit and we wish to keep possession of them. We will not cede one single inch of the lands we inhabit beyond what has been formerly decided by our fathers. And we expressly forbid you to take a single stick of timber or a single beaver from the lands we inhabit. The lands we inhabit have been given to us by the master of life. We acknowledge to hold only from him.
Kini Dombak, and tell every zee let's stand I want to ask a good so quick kick back when on goes on. We go down now, me all on Pam Giskak. A coolie payo, mziwi awani yo dalik. Hello, my friends. It's good to see you all here. It's been a long time. You are welcome here, all of you. We come together today, a gathering. To remember. Mik Waldam, we remember. Nimik Waldam, no kames no gak. Tandamahom no gak. Tandalongomo mek. Tanaguniak, tasisisak. We remember our grandmothers, our grandfathers, all of our relations, the old ones, and those yet to come. Matampa Moani, good afternoon. My name's Liz Coldwin Santana Kaiser. I'm an elder and a councilwoman for the Chabana Gagamog Band of Nipmuc Indians. It's my pleasure today to be walking on this land that my ancestors walked on many years ago. It's a time when we can remember what happened on May 19th, 1676. It was a horrific day for the Nipmuc people. This is a day for me and my family and the Nipmuc people to remember what happened here. There was a massacre that took place here. And many of those people that had died during that time were my relatives, were my ancestors. And I'm here to pay honors to them. In my heart, I'm singing for those that were once here. There's a strong spiritual connection here because this area at one time was a communal village for thousands of years. We're the indigenous people. We're the people that have been here for thousands and thousands of years. But we've been just kind of blotted out of everything. We're always kind of not seen, not heard. Um, and it's important that people hear what we have to say and to understand, again, that you know we are here. We've always been here. Uh, we didn't just disappear because you gotta remember, the books that every book here in New England was like there's no Indians here anymore they all went somewhere else they all were killed you know it's like and that's not true I don't want people to think of us as something that's just history there are a lot of people that are really you know invested into what we once did but for me this is more about we're a living culture and we, we, we have survived we want people to realize that the Nipmuc people are still alive. We are thriving, um, and we will always be thriving. Da 
It's a time for us to move forward and find ways that we can work together. Find ways that you can understand Native people and who we are. I'm a Nipmuc elder and I'm here. And I have been here and so have my people. We've been written off many, many times as not being here. But as I stand here, I am here and I am a Nipmuc. As humans, sometimes we get confused. We make poor decisions. That's not the end of things. You have the next opportunity to make another decision and to move back toward balance. That is our work today. That is why we are here. Ulaloka, Wongan, this is good work. Thank you for joining in it. Things are changing. We're moving back toward balance. Let's embrace that. Let's do this together. We're all people. Uskit kamik winoak. We are all human beings dwelling here on this surface. So I just want to say thank you. Kitsi Uli Uni, great thanks for coming to Kitsi Pontuk, the Great Falls, Pamgiskak, today. Gathering together. Ma'alakusak. A good gathering. And I look forward to more stories, more sharing together, and working with all of you to move back toward balance and into right relationship. Mikwaldam, we remember. Asqua no Dibana Yodali, we are all still here. We say in Abenaki, we say Uli Bumkani, which means originally travel well by canoe, but we use it for cars and buses and bikes and whatever else today. So Uli Bumkani, travel well, be safe, and have a good day. My name is Liz Coldwin Santana Kaiser. I'm 71 years old. I am an elder and a councilwoman on the Chabonagogabog Band of Nipmuc Indians, which is my tribe. We've always known who we were as Nipmuc people, and we are able to go back in history and in different documents to find members of our family back in the 1600s. We are Nipmuc people, and we are from Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, parts of Maine and New Hampshire. We are still here, we are still alive, we still exist, and we still carry on our traditions and our culture. We didn't share that with a lot of people because it wasn't the thing to do, because we were always being called names and being made in front of, so we kind of kept all of our traditions to ourselves. Now I think it's a good time to share these things with people. We're able to talk about who we are. And we're able to show the things that we do today, which is still making regalia, dancing, telling stories. One of the main things is sharing our stories because we had an oral history. And so it's only till now that things are being written down. But for my growing up, it was being told stories. And we were told many stories. Many stories about my grandmother. She was very tough, very, very tough. And she was the head of the family. So growing up, when you got sick, you didn't go to the doctor. You would go to my grandmother. She always had medicine, especially in the wintertime, on the back of the stove. Back in them days, 
You go to my grandmother's house, you get a dose of this, and it was kind of icky tasting. But I'll tell you, none of us ever had a cold. None of us got sick. My grandmother's remedies always worked, not only for her grandkids, but for her kids as well. I had some cousins who have blonde hair and blue eyes. And so growing up on the hill, and we were all together, we all faced racism. They were being called names because they were related to us. We were being called names because of the color of our skin. So we had a, a hard time in a lot of ways, but we overcame that because we had each other. And we were proud of who we were. Even though we know that we got called names and we had to fight all the time, we were very proud of who we were. Growing up in school was, was hard f for me. They made you feel uncomfortable. They would talk about the Native Americans. Uh, we were savages. Um, we killed people. And so when you're sitting in a classroom and you're the only person of color there, everybody looks at you when you're talking about this particular Indian they might have been talking about. So now all the eyes are on, on you and you want to kind of like slump down in, in your chair because you're embarrassed because they're saying that we're savages, that we're nothing but murderers. And all the kids are looking at us like, well, you know, is this what, who you are? And indeed, that's not who we are. Now, we learned about European uh, history. I know all about European history, but they never taught us once about our history, not one time. And when they did talk about indigenous people, it was always negative. It was nothing good about what they've done. It was nothing good said about how we tried to save our own country, but that we were savages for trying to do that. We were taught through these teachers, and, and I understand that they didn't understand neither about our history, and so they couldn't teach us our history. But in doing that, they felt that it was necessary for us to learn European history, which really, to me today, it, it makes me wonder, didn't they know that we had a history first, that we were here first, and that our story needs to be told? It's not a good story. The things that happened to us, the way that they came through this country, um, it isn't a good story, but it is one, and it's one that needs to be told. In my school presentations, I talk a lot about misconceptions because they don't know what a Native American is supposed to really look like. All they've ever been taught was what they've learned on TV um, is that we look like out west, or we look like a Disney character, um, or that we don't come in all different shades, sizes, and we do. But I talk about the fact that we still have our traditions and we still have our culture and we still practice that. All of my grandchildren have their names. All of them go to the powwows. All of them go to the circle. They are always smudged. They always dance. And so they are part of it. And I'm proud of it. One of my grandsons says to me, he calls me Mima. He says, you know, Mima, I know about being a nitmuck because of you. He says, but Mima, I know who I am by you. And I said, well, I'm glad to hear that. But all of my grandchildren are involved in who they are. My name is Wes Pecor II. I'm 63 years old. My family were, were taught, I always knew that we're indigenous, native people. My grandmother told me that we're from the Massachusetts tribe. It's always been a proud part of my heritage, just the way that my family's lived in the woods and out in nature all the time. That was always, everything was outside and be involved in nature with hunting, fishing, camping, all those things and just living. This is my church. That's where everything goes on for me and out in nature. That's where my spiritual 
heart comes from, my beliefs. That's where I go to become one with everything. I'm a part of it. I feel I'm a part of it. I'm a part of all this. I feel that this is what I was supposed to do. I'm giving honor back to nature that I feel that it gave me. Maybe me carving it is keeping that beauty for other people to see what I see. There's an emotion in here, so it's like I'm, I'm taking something out of my heart and putting it there for everybody to see. Maybe they won't see what part of me is in it, but I know it's there. I'm charged by so many different things. Everything inspires me, just to watch a butterfly fly or the way a bird does something. And then I go, all right, now I want to, and it's usually animals. I'm trying to get down to give the illusion of being paper thin mm -hmm. and leaving it thick in here at the same time. And this is uh, mahogany. I don't want to put too much pressure because there's a void under here and it's a good crack. I'm always trying to do harder things because I always try to challenge myself more. There's just something about the African elephant that I really like. They're amazing creatures. This is a cherry burrow. And when I saw it, I knew I had to do something with it and the colors in here are just all that stuff I think is phenomenal. And this is cherry as well. And this was for my dad when he was in the hospital and I brought it up and he just loved it. He was, he was an old bear out in the woods his whole life. Imagination is a terrible thing to waste. I can't say that enough times. I do a lot of dragons. This has gotten a lot of attention over the years, kids especially with your imagination, what you can do is just endless with dragons. The cool thing about them is no one can tell you it doesn't look like that. I had a lot of fun doing this. So this is a very interesting piece. This piece of wood I found in a dumpster. It had been a bench for a hundred years. I just love this piece of wood. So this is a big old piece of, I believe it's swamp poplar. Uh, I don't know how many years ago I got it, but it's a gigantic tree. And I made this rocker out of it. With all the deer on it. The king buck is on the back, looking over everybody. And these are all different does and smaller bucks and so forth. If you've got the imagination and uh, the willingness Anything is possible. It's definitely a conversation piece at any show or anybody coming to the house, everybody loves it.
My name is Monica Alexander. My heritage is Mi'kmaq. In English, that is Mi'kmaq. They are one of five tribes collectively known as the Wabanaki. That means people of Dawnland. They are indigenous to Nova Scotia, New Brunswick, the Gaspé Peninsula. The other part of my ancestry, which I am just as proud of, is French and Scottish. I have been an artist all my life. I tell people I was born with a pencil in my hand. My mediums are pencil, pen, ink, acrylics, beadwork, leather work, and porcupine quill work on birch bark, which is a very old medium amongst the Northeastern peoples. The art is, in its various forms or mediums, is so old. The art speaks of those people. It is them. The Mi'kmaq people were known for their, uh, their quill work on bark. S these examples have been reported by French Jesuits as early as the early to mid 1700s. This is a uh, native white birch, birch bark, and the piece is called a box purse. Pieces like this go back to the Victorian era, and they mainly targeted wealthy tourists who came into Maine, New Brunswick, Nova Scotia. In the beginning, they sold for like pennies, or the women would barter for flour, sugar, coffee, whatever. And then when the interest started to grow with collectors of serious indigenous art, they realized, wow, these are important pieces, and fetched thousands of dollars. They, the, the, uh, the value of them grew because the collectors realized this is real serious art. So here I am in my studio. This is where I do everything, do my artwork, whether it be drawing, painting, quilling. These are the, the tools of my trade. That is a tine from a deer antler. And that is a leather needle. It's very sharp. And I use either these, needle nose pliers, or I use these. These are very old. You can't even find these anymore, I don't think. And a good pair of scissors. A knife, that's for scraping the bark. And those are quills in their natural state. Very sharp, very dangerous. These are the different colors. These are aniline dyes or writ dye. Originally, they would have used plants, roots, wild fruits, flowers to make the dyes. We have black, we have scarlet, and we have sea foam, and I already have them soaking in little dishes. Everything has to be wet. The bark has to be wet. So there's the little, there's the stencil, just a basic outline. So eventually, it'll look like that. And if you guess hummingbird, you've, you've guessed correctly. Making an, an earring, any kind of quilling, it begins with an idea. My best inspiration is to walk in the woods where it's quiet. It gives me good time to think, 
to look at the plants, to interact with plants because that's what Native people do. We are connected to the earth. So when I'm in the woods, I'm inspired by, could be a chipmunk, could be a bird call. And by the time I get home, I, ah, I got an idea. I usually sit down at a piece of paper and draw my ideas first in pencil and then in color. I use uh, acrylics, paints, or uh, crayons. Art has to come at its own pace. Art cannot be forced. It, it has to be what it wants to be. That's the first owl I've ever done. That was really tricky to do. I think I'd rather paint and draw owls than quill them because they are such a complex creature. Anything to do with feathers, you can't possibly get every detail, but you can come close to it. I love chickadees. They are a very intelligent bird. For me, they epitomize New England. This is called an envelope box for the manner that it opens. And then you open it up to reveal Monarch in like a side view. And then you open it up to reveal the Monarch butterfly in its full glory, outspread. The butterfly is so complex when you look at the coloring and the design in that. When people say, wow, you want a lot of money for that. I said, wow, it took me several weeks or days or whatever. So that's why I have to have the price on there that I get. And I explain it and then they get it. Some people do, some people don't. So like, no. Everything takes time. I'm not Walmart. Art is like, for me, it's like breathing. Why do I draw a picture? Why do I paint a picture? Because art for me is like air. I can't live without air. I've always been an artist ever since I was a little kid. I was self-taught, never went to school, never took a lesson. Every time I put in a quill, I feel very proud and very happy. Art is directly connected to all Native people. Doing art is a way to explain origins, where people came from. Art for me is important. It's who I am and why I am. And making a quill piece, when I get done, I go, wow, did I really do that? That's, that's really amazing. <laughs> um, it just, it, it gives me joy, but it gives me joy when somebody comes along and goes, Oh my God, that's the most beautiful thing I've ever seen. I gotta have it. Welcome you all to the Pecum Tux Homelands Festival. I hope everybody's here to have a good time. We have a lot of wonderful things lined up for you. My name's Andre Strong Bearheart from the Nipmuc Nation. And uh, you know, we're out here not too far from Nipmuc territory. This is Pocumtuck, Nipmuc, 
uh, Mohican, and uh, we're on the outskirts out here. This is where we all came and gathered and fished together, and you know, there was a massacre out here. And so to be able to uh, be out here today with some of our Mashpee relatives and uh, some Ojibwe and um, Penobscot was out here today. Uh, different types of Narragansett and um, di many nations. Dene I see over there. Um, it's really wholesome and it felt good out here today. And um, I just really want to say that uh, our people are still here. We still have our traditional ways of living. We still speak our language. We still perform our ceremonies. We're still very much alive here in the East. We're out here today, tanning hides and remembering these old ways. We just opened up our vending stand today called No Loose Braids. And the whole meaning for that is bringing communities together, whether it's Penobscot or uh, Mashpee or whether it's Shinnecock, you know, it's about braiding these people and places and ceremony and language and ways back together in a strong way, you know. Um, that braid taught us a lot of different things, but, you know, uh, what's important for me is to remain in a particular type of path that I can weave my journey and my family into a particularly strong way of living. For me, it's of the utmost importance to be able to teach whatever knowledge I have to all these young ones that are around me. My nieces, my nephews were here. That makes me really happy that I know that I've given them enough knowledge to be able to keep a tradition alive. I was working with my niece, teaching her how to rack a skin onto a frame. Basically, it was just cutting holes around a deer hide and shoelacing it, weaving it throughout that frame. Then it's gonna dry and then we would go through many different various processes of turning into either buckskin, something that we could wear, or it would be a hair on, meaning it was going to be a cape to keep warm or it would be a blanket to lay on or even just a gift to give somebody because it was very nice to give somebody a gift of a blanket especially um, a traditional blanket. It's really important for me to be able to teach these young ones that these skills aren't lost. And that relationship between that deer and that animal doesn't just end with the meat that comes off of it. It's all the different parts that come out of that animal through bone, through the sinew, through um, the brains itself to tan the hide, you know. Um, there's traditional ways and values that we still keep alive. It's really important to share those things. I think that the young people need to ask the elders and the, uh, what they call it, so-called leaders, both state, county, federal, in the United States or in the world, what young people need to ask the older, older generation, when are you going to stop lying to us? When? And only when you stop lying to us can we have a future that's built on trust and sincere and uh, good things. That's the first question. When you lose something or when somebody becomes alcoholic, you have to go through different stages of emotions. Sometimes they say you lose your spirituality, then you get mad. You get mad at yourself, you get mad at your family, and you get mad at your society. And so those are the natural symptoms of a sick sickness or a disease. 
so that young people has to learn how to go through that frustration and hopelessness feeling until all of a sudden they'll see the light. And that's where the truth needs to be available because the truth is what will inspire them and give them the pat on the back to not give up. That's what I'm referring to is once they've gone through the systematic recovery healing which involves pain, anger, and frustration, the truth, we have better get ready to put it before them, for that's the food that they need to energize them to fix all the broken things and to reconnect with the spiritual elements that give us life. And what are those spiritual elements? It's water all over the world that we drink, it's water all over the world that makes medicine to heal our sick. It's water that quenches our thirst every day. It should never be polluted. The young and the old are supposed to have been protecting that, not polluting it. Then the air that we breathe every day to our kids to grow has to be good air, clean air, so they can finish their job and their mission why they were born. And we shouldn't put polluted air to cause them to get cancer and asthma where they can't breathe and have the struggle to live. That young has to make sure they put things in place to limit that, to stop it in its track. So did the air, the deers and the birds and the people can have a good air. Why aren't they doing something to protect our interest instead of worrying about efficiency of making money? That's the, what's on the plate of our young. And there's no choice. If they don't, if they get lazy, and frustrated and don't pull through that healing process to meet truth and then action, then their kids will not have a world to live in. They will not have health or peace or tranquility. In the native world where I grew up, I heard over and over our leaders say, in our constitution, that's 2,000 years old, that when our leaders make decisions from day to day, that they have to have the mind sight, insight of a mind that sees seven generations ahead. So whatever decision they make today and tomorrow will not injure or hurt our kids and grandkids and great-grandchildren, seven generations, tomorrow. So every decision they make today has to be in the, for the protection of our children and grandchildren. That's absent in America. That's absent at Alcoa. That's absent in General Motors. That's absent in General Electric. That's absent in everything that should not be, because do we not love our kids and our children? Yes, we do. Then we must act. the Kingfisher singers and dancers. We're going to be focused mostly on Northeastern style social dance songs. 
we are Eastern Proto Algonquian speaking people and part of the uh, sort of greater Algonquian uh, language family speaking people. So we're very close relatives to the Mahican people just west of us, with the Pecumtuck people of this area, with the Nipmuc and the Narragansett, of course, being Leah's people, uh, Niantic people, and of course, all other related nations in the region. So these social dance songs, these traditional songs, they've been traded and shared for many, many generations. songs make their rounds, they change, the styles change based on the nation that's singing them and how they're performing them. Because, of course, we are living, moving people and we change over time. But we also hold those traditional values and those songs and we do the very best we can to pass them down to the next generation in the proper way. For us, this is definitely a family affair. So we teach our little ones from a very young age with the hopes that they will then grow up and they will be the ones to carry on these songs to the next generation. So you can see our little one here um, has been singing since before he could walk. So you might be curious a little bit about our instruments. What I'm carrying right here is uh, what is referred to as a water drum, and it quite literally has water inside of it. And uh, some of these drums are carved out of wood. Some of them actually traditionally were made from uh, clay pots. And so this is just deer skin wet, stretched over the wooden frame. And so it gives you a nice hollow resonance because of the water inside the drum. So it just has a very sweet sound. We also have um, rhythm sticks. So I have these rhythm sticks here. And these are made from uh, essentially a hardwood. A lot of different types of hardwood would be used. I also have uh, rattles of different styles. So I don't know if folks want to talk about the rattles that they have. Feel free. Mine is a little different than theirs. It's made from a, a gourd, a dried, hollowed out gourd that I put little stones in and I paint it. And mine is made out of etched birch bark, and there are um, sassafras wooden beads inside. Ours are made out of buffalo horn and cow horn. Um, it's, been, it's hollow naturally, and you can hollow it out further, polish it really well, and then you can use a combination of seeds. So you might use some corn and bean seeds, or you can be um, a little more radical and use something like BBs, but sometimes that's too loud. So I like the nice, um, more natural sound.
the banks of this river here would have been at this time of year teeming with a lot of native people gathered, celebrating, singing. They would have been planting their corn, just like there are a lot of corn fields, tobacco fields, and other types of crops being grown along the Connecticut River. It was that way for thousands upon thousands of years. So this is a very fertile valley. Remember that these places around us, all of the beautiful forests, the valleys, the springs, these rivers, they're all life givers and they all deserve respect and they all deserve to be considered. When you dance, when you sing, when you socialize, when you, when you gather with your family, or when you give thanks, you have to give thanks for these things because they're the reason we are here. They're the reason we breathe every single day. Those trees are giving you the opportunity to breathe. And so if we don't remember them and we don't give thanks to them and if we don't dance for them and sing for them, then they may not be so kind to us. And we aren't kind to them already. Like, you know, we're, we're not being respectful respectful as, as uh, a lot of people on earth today and yet they're still giving every single day to keep us alive. Listen to the earth with your heart, you'll hear the dreams of our ancestors. <laughs> 